Why are police photographing our license plates? What are we doing for veterans returning home damaged physically and mentally, suffering from depression, homelessness, and suicide? Why did the Supreme Court deposit corporate money into our electoral process? Should we redefine middle class as working poor? Or is it just another Wall Street merger? What's really behind new voter picture ID laws in certain states? Why aren't NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox asking these questions? Welcome to the Reasonable Voice radio show. I'm your host, Marcello Rolando, the Reasonable Voice. The mission of the Reasonable Voice is to connect the dots between politics and finance the need for better and more affordable education, our humanity, world peace, and, of course, the arts, which we then gladly provide our listeners, the voting public, as informative food for thought to provoke their self-determination and appetite for equal economic opportunity and justice for all without truth decay. The Reasonable Voices are advocates prioritizing education, preserving our history, leading by example for a peaceful and prosperous world by evoking and embracing both creative artists and political unity as solutions to our challenges. Hello and welcome to the Reasonable Voices News Talk radio program. I'm your host, Marcello Rolando, the Reasonable Voice. And I'm having a really special show, very personal show tonight, because my guest, my reasonable voice, is Lawrence Dresner. I call him Larry, of course. Larry is a composer. He's a lyricist. We've worked together before. I've directed his work. And a couple of months ago, I received a call out of the blue from my friend, Larry Dresner. I hadn't heard from him in quite a while. Hi, that would be me. I'm Larry Dresner. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be that kind of show, folks. He's a really talented composer and and lyricist, but like my father, he doesn't talk very much. And like I admired my father for it, I always envied my father. My mother and I talk a great deal. My father and I would say one phrase, and yet in that phrase he could capture reams, pages of what I say. Well, Larry is very much the same way. He talks through his music and his, his lyrics, but I'm going to get him to talk today. In any case, <laughs> we, I think I mentioned we had worked together a number of years ago uh, now uh, on a musical theater show. I was the director. Do you want to tell them how long ago? Or was uh, yeah, well, we don't have to tell them everything. <laughs> it's been a while, though. And, of course, he was the composer on that work. It was Tiffany. And if you check and find it, you'll you'll find out how long ago it was. But we worked really well together, I felt, so... Anyway, he had this idea that really intrigued me. Yeah, so the idea was this. You know, I've written a lot of music over the years, and not all, all of it has been performed, you know, for one reason or another. And I thought it would be fun to combine them in a cabaret show, find some really talented performers, and just have it performed. I, I've directed cabarets before, one featuring, by the way, the great Joey Fay, when he was 80 years old and had been in show business for 60 years. Uh, which was much older than I was when I directed him. But I've done cabaret, but it was something about, I, I just thought the music that Larry sent me, there was something more there. How did you feel? Okay, so, you know, when, when I write music, I write in a lot of different styles, basically whatever the material calls for. So one time I could be writing a traditional Broadway number, like an 11 o'clock number, they call it, or something that sounds like, you know, came out of Tin Pen Alley or art song. So, it just depends on what makes the material most effective for the listener. Now, you said art song. You mean like classical music? Yeah. I, I didn't know that. that. Stuff, chamber work, so-called modern classical, all that stuff, because sometimes that's what the material calls for. But uh, I think we've only used one of those songs in the show that we're putting together here. Yeah. I, um, I'm i not surprised to hear that, because your music has quite a classical how do I want to say this? It sounds like musical theater and other styles, as, as you've confessed, you do that. But it has a classical quality, if that makes sense. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Musician? Totally. I mean, I, I have a master's in composition from the New England Conservatory of Music, so maybe I picked up a trick or two. Well, there you go. All right, that explains everything. No wonder we get along. You're from New England Conservatory. I'm from Peabody Conservatory. It's too much. I love yeah. that. Yeah. 
I knew that part yeah. about your bio, but uh, but I'd forgotten. Uh, I guess I don't know. I just love your music. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I thought you know a cabaret would work because since the songs have been written in various parts of my career and they're about different characters and different situations, you can't really find solid, I think, story that would encompass it all. So I was hoping that you, Marcello, could help find a theme around it where we could put together dialogue that would try to make the show hang together. And I, of course, accepted Larry's assessment. I mean, and that his desire to find some kind of theme. And when, and initially, I think when we spoke, I agreed with him. But the more I listened to his music, and he sent <laughs> he sent me music with some very good singers. But he also sent audio of the songs that where a computer did the singing. <laughs> and then. That's better than hearing me sing it. Yeah, well, I was going to make that joke. I was going to say, but he sent one or two with him singing. Now, one, which one I love the most. But anyway. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, but the more I listened to the music he sent, and of course he sent sheet music too, the more I thought, no, there's more here. There's a story here. This is a book musical. And that kind of sent us off. And what I loved is that with every time I've ever worked with Larry, when I ever go... What if Larry listens, and then the next thing you know, he's just in there flying? I, I want to tell one quick story, and then I'll let Larry talk, I promise. We, we, the show we worked on was Tiffany, and we, we did uh, quite a lot with it. And it was only one act when he and the lyricist on that show was Dale Johnson, a very good friend of ours. But it needed a song, and I s suggested, oh, it should be a song like this and this and this, and maybe cover this and make this point or whatever. And Larry came in the next day with the song. I mean, it was great. Go ahead, you go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, one of the things I enjoy working with you is that we don't have any egos that get in the way. Uh, we both see things, you know, very similarly about what a song or a scene needs in order to make it work. And we're not afraid to say right up front about what works and what doesn't. And it's been, a, you know, a great collaboration when we work together on that show. And just to be a little more clear, the show Tiffany isn't about the breakfast at Tiffany oh, yes. that you might be thinking about. It's about the stained glass artist Louis Comfort Tiffany, who lived in the early part of the 1900s. And he was really well known for his stained glass, but he was also aspiring to be an artist. In fact, he created a, a movement of art. And the musical was about the challenges he faced as an artist, trying to be accepted for his serious art, not just the stained glass art. So it had a lot of... Good, good story about, you know, there was a love interest, there was conflict, resolution, and all that good stuff. You know, I'm glad you, see, you can talk. I'm glad you made that point because, you know, I we dealt with that, of course, when we were doing the show. But I had forgotten that when I say Tiffany, people probably think we're talking about Breakfast of Tiffany. So thanks for clearing that up. But he was indeed a real person, and he was the son of the jeweler, or yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If we say Tiffany Glass, they'll know who we're talking about. Yep. And yeah, so even though some of my songs from that show, I think, are really great, you know, really good, uh -huh. if, uh, we didn't incorporate any of them in what we're working on now because it just didn't fit the overall arc that you, you were seeing the show is fitting in. It was an sh ongoing showcase. We did it at least once a year for three or four years. And we did it in different mm -hmm. locations, but one of the locations was a church that actually had a Tiffany stained glass window, and yeah. uh, that was really moving. The I remember one of the performances we actually had, I think Lewis's grandson attend, and he really thought that we had captured the essence of what you know, his grandfather was about, and you know, really approved of what the work was. But... You know, we're going back a number of years and years have passed, and uh, we've both gone in different directions at that point. And now we're just, you know, working on this show where the songs that I've written over the years, I'd like to see them, you know, have life on the stage. Yes, and I would too. And I think, I think what we're going to do, Larry and I have been talking about this, we are going to give you a little teaser, you know, on YouTube or wherever, of, of some of the songs that are in the show. And of course, this comes because it's not like we didn't want to do a, a theatrical production. We were putting all that together, Larry and I, and, you know, we're, I'm writing the book, 
he's doing the music and lyrics and we're saying we're going to open this and and then of course COVID hit and, and like everybody else in show business we've had to figure out okay how do we get around this we did not stop we've held auditions we are in the midst of callbacks we may continue callbacks we're doing some recordings that we can do you know zoom doesn't work for that everybody knows that but we've got some songs and we're going to be teasing you on youtube so look for that on the reasonable voices youtube that youtube channel is up and running so we're going to start with that but we will have when we're ready to announce the title of the show and all that we will have our own show youtube channel larry because he said something about thought his songs were pretty great well, he had some fabulous songs in Tiffany, but one that definitely was a showstopper. And I knew at the moment I heard it, and that was Reach for the Sky. Tell me what, what, in, what inspired that, Larry, and how you went about composing it, because it not only was the song for the leading lady, but it became the finale, at least when I directed it. <laughs> and it was a, a yeah, well, you know, go. Well, it was that Louis, Louis Tiffany was constantly getting rejection by people because they all thought he should just concentrate on his father's jewelry or the stained glass and not strike out as on his own as an artist. And with all these challenges facing him, his wife, Mary, kept encouraging him. So at the end of the show, she says, you know, don't be discouraged. You got to reach for your sky and go for everything that you want without regret. So I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that kind of a song. And I was just lucky in hearing a melody that worked. And every time we perform that, I mean, you get like a standing ovation. So it gives me chills whenever I hear it. Oh, and I feel the same way. And for all the years between that show and this, whenever I thought I had an opportunity that I could use that song, Reach for the Sky, I would call Larry and say, you know, I want to do this just to feature it in, a, in an evening performance with someone. But tell me, you said you heard the melody. I, I want to know how you do this because I've always loved your music. Tell us, how do you do that? You mean it's in your head? You you see the lyric or you what? What do you do? I read the lyric over and over again and find the rhythm of the words. You know, when um, things might be a little faster or things might be a little slower, I also look for what the lyric is saying, the emotional content, and then I just hear a melody. And then I just check it out, play it, maybe fine tune it. There are some things that most composers know about. On certain words, you want to lift the melody up, other words, bring it down, and you got to be able to keep moving it along to reaching to an apex and something like that. So that just all, like, just comes. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, and let's make a connection with the show we're working on now that you were composing mm -hmm. music. You just sent me a brand new song. No, not the song yet. You sent me the lyrics. But I loved it. In, yes, I loved it right away and thought this would be a great finale. So where yeah. are you with that? Are you at because now you're not talking about someone else's lyrics. You're talking about your own. So you write the lyric and then what? Well, I do a lot of free association with words and phrases that might be used in the final song. And then just by keep free associating and trying different combinations, things start falling into place. What seems to be a natural flow. And I could discard something, bring it back in, try it someplace else, and eventually it just feels right. And then I start, will think about a melody because I don't want to set a melody to a bad lyric or an awkward lyric. So mm -hmm. I wait until I'm pretty confident that the lyrics are what I want them to say. And then I start tinkering around with the melody. So, you know, in a lot of musical shows, the last song's written is the introduction and the finale because mm -hmm. you got to wait to find out what the show is about and where, where the arc is and what the bottom line is, what you want to say, which you would summarize in the finale. So that's why at this point, I'm starting to work in the finale because we do have an arc, we do have an overall theme. So it's working pretty well. Uh, the other, the intro, I think it still needs a little more work, but we'll, we'll get there. I know. And I... It's interesting because just to be clear, I, I mean, I've worked on a lot of original shows and I was there primarily as the director trying to to make it a production. But the way our new show is going is that Larry, as I said, gave me about 30 songs, I guess, and, and I started writing a book to connect them. And we don't have all 30 in the show. But for you, Larry, in the past, when you've worked on with other people's lyrics, like Dale's, for instance, you 
how is that different from doing your own lyrics and coming up with a song? Well, sure. If a lyricist can also write music, or certainly if they could sing, I think their lyrics would be better because sometimes I might be given lyrics that is not just not singable, either because of the consonant or they want to end on an awkward word. So there's got to be give and take back and forth about what might be a, a more singable word that conveys the same thing or maybe go in a different direction because there are some things that singers just are not better at singing than other words. So you have to be aware of that and try to incorporate that. But as long as the end lyric still accomplishes the goal of what you want to say, the fact that you're making it easier to sing just makes the song that much more powerful. And also that much more challenging to compose because it isn't just that you're trying to write a beautiful melody, but you're trying to write a, a beautiful melody that the singer can sing with that particular word, the text. That's uh, And it doesn't always have to be a beautiful melody because sometimes you don't want the melody to take away from the words. You just need the words to sit on top of the music and let the words carry the day. And the music is just like the engine to drive it along because you don't want to distract too much from the words. All right. Well, this is great. I mean, we've had many conversations about shows and music and lyrics while we were busy working on the productions. Yeah. But we've never sat down on a radio show <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and really talked about, yeah, and talked about how we do it and Indeed, we do work very similarly. One more story from Larry. I'll set it up. I don't remember the title of the song, but I do remember that we, I felt we're missing a big ensemble number. Larry, I always felt his greatest work were love duets. He kind of, the extremes, very serious romance and funny romance or funny anything. And I was just used to that. But I said to him, you know, we, we need a big ensemble number, you know, to open the second act of Tiffany. And Larry said, OK, I can do that. And the next day there it was. Do you remember? Because it was wow. It was really exhilarating to direct it because it, it just it lent itself so well to moving this mass of people around on this stage. And remember all the hoops and things we went through and figure eights of, with, you know, what, 40 people on the stage or something. But. You remember what I'm talking about? It, it, might, it might have been the, the gallery scene where Louis has his first exhibit of the, his paintings and people are walking around the gallery looking at the paintings and making comments. So it's a combination of patter along with side comments made by Louis and his wife. Yes. I think that might be the number you're thinking of. That, that was the one. And it just gallery. swooping swooping moves that I was able to get people to do. But that's, as I tell Larry all the time, and then I promise we'll take a break, it's his fault because it's his music. <laughs> it's his music and now his music and lyrics that give me my directorial ideas. And I know, cool. I really mean that, and you know, I've told you many times. Listen, we're going to take a short break. We are having a very personal professional show today with Larry Dresner, composer and lyricist, Longtime friend. We've worked together before. I've directed his shows before, his music before, but it is the first time that I'm writing a book for his music. So we're going to talk as much as we can without giving away everything in this next segment about the new musical. I'll tell you this much, we're on our third title. Stay with us. We'll be right back with my good friend, composer, lyricist, Larry Dresner. Stay with us. And now... Another Film Rental Discovery. Welcome to the Indie Film Minute. Movie geeks, take note. Quartet is Dustin Hoffman's first directing credit. Let us see what this old pro might have up his artistic sleeve. Ah, no tricks, deep meaning or acting bravado. Just a delightful stroll through an old age home filled with funny and lovable retired performers. Sure, there are threads of a plot. One couple were married once, but she cheated soon after the wedding, and he has never forgiven her. She was a big star and is still a diva, and arrives to shake up the place with her airs and demands. Another thread is the unlikely need to put on a show, ostensibly to save their beloved retirement home with the proceeds. But for the show to work, the old lovers must reunite, and our diva must be able to hit a note she is no longer confident can be reached. Not exactly heavy material, but we celebrate Quartet for what may be the best reason of all. It's simply enjoyable entertainment. 
Here we have another entry into the silver dollar trend. Films on senior subjects populated by the most appealing of elder stars. The humanity is real, the laughs strike true, and we learn that Dustin Hoffman respects us by not taking himself too seriously. What's not to like? Quartet. Not in theaters. Discovery through rental. Find us on the web at IndieFilmMinute.com. Welcome back to the Reasonable Voices News Talk Radio Program. I'm your host, Marcello Rolando, and I'm taking some personal time today. My guest today is Larry Dresner, lyricist and composer I've known for at least 30 years. And Larry and I have worked together on songs that he's composed in the past for a show called Tiffany. And the man who wrote the book and the lyrics for Tiffany was Dale Johnson, our good friend. But Larry came with a... Oh, about 30 songs, I guess, and and said, what can we do with this? The initial thought was a cabaret, but as usual, Larry's fault, his music is so good, it moved me to say, no, this needs to be a book musical, and I began to write the book. And we were all set to go into production, and then Broadway closed. Understandably, a global pandemic can do that. So we've been working since, he composing more songs, my writing more book. And thinking directorially, we've been auditioning people and all who recognize the title, who audition. Thank you so very much. The callbacks have gone out and we are in the process of that. But until we can be certain that it's safe, not only to go into a sound studio or a theater, but safe to ask the callbacks to come and sing some more for us, we are writing more, composing more and planning on launching something maybe even March 2021, but again, COVID's in charge. Okay, so Larry, we're back. What can we tell? Basically, the show is, has two men and two women. They play different characters, and they stay in the characters for the entire show. But the idea behind the songs, they're in different styles, which I've written over my career. And the songs are different points of views about different situations in life that the, uh, the characters face what to do about the situation, how to come out of it. And I think a lot of people can relate to the themes and the, and the you know, feelings that are expressed in a number of these songs, and they can relate to it. And hopefully, you know, they'll enjoy the show while learning something maybe about themselves or about humanity, maybe. You know, that's so good because you said so much that's very true, and yet you didn't tell them anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? But all of that's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Seriously, though, that was incredible. By the way, I want to say, recently, I directed a 10-minute play about Lincoln. It's called Stealing Lincoln, one of the best scripts I've ever directed. And I asked the playwright, after it was all said and done, everybody was happy, why she wrote a 10-minute play. And she said, well, it was a contest, and they wanted only 10 minutes. If they wanted more, I would have done more. Well, all that to say... When Larry came to me and we had discussions about the practicality of producing, I said, well, how many characters do you want me to write? And he said, four. So that's why they're four. (laughs) But recently I said to him, because, again, we're in the middle of rewrites and writing more songs, etc. I said, how about a fifth character? I need a fifth character very specifically for something. And he, without hesitation, said, sure, that's fine. So, Larry. Okay. Yeah. Well. Do you have a name for the character yet? uh, No, I don't have a name for it. But he is a new wrinkle, a new challenge for at least three of the original four. What I'm loving about not only what I write, but what what Larry composes and his lyrics, we have a, a big arc. We have a big story to tell. But within the big story, as Larry alluded to, these people are dealing with their own lives. Each has an arc. Each has, you know, tragedies and comedies and and memories and and things to overcome. So, but what they didn't have in my book, I didn't believe, is that they didn't have an antagonist outside of their smaller arc and the big arc. And I think it needs that. And so and as we're doing all these rewrites, could I write in a fifth character? And whether he remembers it or not, he said yes, so we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever makes the show better, man. 
<laughs> okay. So what do you, when you approach this show in particular, which was originally called, by the way, we're on our third title. We've had three in our very first one. We will share passionately pursuing a life of excellence. And Larry was very kind. He went along with that title. Even though I had friends that said, why do you want something so long? Who's going to, it's not a catchphrase, you know, and what, uh, you know, won't ever fit on a marquee and all that. But there were reasons I chose it. And I think it, first of all, Larry's fault again, his music made me think of that title. Uh, it reminded me of a, a guest who is uh, who has become a friend who has written books about passionately pursuing a life of excellence. But Larry discovered that if you put in my name online with passionately pursuing a life of excellence, you go to this guest who writes these books. So that was one of the reasons we wanted to change it. But Larry, what in the book is any Oh, let's put that because you, of course, gave the songs first. What is in the book, if anything, that inspires new songs? Well, basically, sometimes your your book will go in another direction that feels logical, which we didn't see at the time. And at some point, it's crying out for a song, you know, because typically characters break out into song when their words alone don't convey to the fullest extent what you want the character to say, which is why characters sing. So when your your book and the dialogue starts going into a place where we need something here, it just feels vo a void mm. until we have a song sung in there. So for me, that's basically how it would work. Well, okay, I'll, I'll take that, and I'll, I'll even take it as a compliment, because certainly, I know I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but your music has always inspired my directing, my ideas, my choices. So... Where are we, as far as you're concerned? I would say we're probably 85% done at this point because I owe you two songs still. Mm. And something you've done is when I send you a song that's a solo and you say, no, this has to be a quartet. Yeah. No, this has to be a trio. <laughs> that's a challenge for me because I have to hear it in a different way. And usually I like it the way it was done. And then to have to split it out between other people and come up with harmonies, it's a challenge to like switch gears like that. But again, if that's what it takes to make the point across, to make the scene work best, and it works logically, then we do it. You know? And you reserve the right to, uh, as separate from the show, to do the song in your original solo version in the cabaret setting or whatever, right? Yeah, I would think so, because it, it could stand alone perfectly well as a character in, in uh, like a, if a cabaret singer wanted to put it in their act because it fit what they were doing, then that's perfectly fine. And then in our show, people would recognize it. Oh, wow, that's a, you know, a quartet or a trio. I know what song you're talking about, and I'll say that, again, trying to skirt around too many details, but two different characters, different times in their lives, but they're in very different places, different spaces. But they have the same issues. And that was why, again, Larry's fault, he gave me the idea in his music. I saw these two songs and I said, if you can make this counterpoint, if you can bring this together, these are the kinds of things I've been saying to Larry for years. You know, if you could do this, if you could do that, and he goes home and makes, makes magic. But if you could do that, then we can juxtapose them on one another and you will have, I believe, double the impact, at least in my head. Sure. What do you think? Yeah, well, one of the things that's unique to stage is you could have two different things going on at the same time that would appear disparate, but then when you put them together, it works on a whole different level. So these two characters are facing the same issue, but they're coming from a different background, different perspective, and they handle that situation differently. And the fact that we could meld them together makes it just a little more powerful because, well, it just does. You know, another example of Larry's music getting to me, there is, I will say this, there's a character in the show. I remember the song, with, and that I won't tell you, but Larry, one of the songs that he sent me, reminded me of a nightmare that I had as a child, and I've never forgotten it. And whenever at family dinners and whatever, my father would always bring it up because he was the, 
the one at home at the time that helped me through the night when I was having this nightmare. In any case, Larry sent a song that was perfect for one of the characters I was writing, and I incorporated that nightmare into that character's story. Then he created other songs that, you know, just came out of it. It's just been rippling. A beautiful stuff. Yeah, well, I, go ahead. Well, the song you're referring to is written from my perspective because I raised kids and I know about, the, you know, nightmares and the kids having it. So any parent who's raised kids could definitely relate to this song. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and even what follows that when the character who's trying to be so brave, so courageous, because for in the show, unlike my experience, in the show, it is a recurring nightmare. She has it more than once as she gets older, and it doesn't go away. I had a different kind of recurring nightmare, but it wasn't this one. This one that's in the show is, I only had once, thank goodness. But she is recurring, and in one of her courageous moments of being independent and strong or whatever, and the way this song leads her, she reaches out at the end in, in perhaps an unexpected way to uh, other people. Love is there, I guess. Well, and it also draws in the fact that what could be a nightmare for a child could be an entirely different nightmare for an adult. Exactly. And I love it about that. That's exactly. Very good. And then those who are trying to, to help are, you know, it's tough to understand where someone else is. You, you know, we always say get in another person's shoes. You have to stand in another person's shoes to know what their life is and what they're going through and why they're doing what they're doing. But sometimes that's a lot easier said than done. What are your thoughts? I agree. I mean, that's one of the reasons why passionately pursuing a life of excellence made sense in the beginning, because every person is always trying to do the best they can. But sometimes they're hampered by emotional baggage, by the situation. But everyone is still trying to do the best they can. They don't do bad things, you know, for purpose like that. So that's why that title made sense at first, but then as we developed this more and more, we needed to move away from that into, you know, a different title that was more encompassing and not directly related to that original title and how it was being used by that other author. Exactly, exactly. And I love the new title, by the way, and the way that came about is that Larry just picked up the phone one day and said, you know, how about, and he's he said the new title, and I went, that's perfect, and that's how we work. And, and that was actually the title of one of the songs that we're using in the show. Exactly. And for now, it seems to be a good working title, but stay tuned, it might change again, who knows? It might. I will say, though, we've had a, um, a couple of readings, very kind and good words for Broadway's Tony Award-winning producer, Ken Davenport, who gave us an opportunity to have his number one dramaturge, Eric Webb, Definitely want to send out a shout because they read the script, gave me some good notes. The feedback was excellent. And I've had a, a second reading in D.C. where we did not have the music, but we did have the lyrics. And, and all that to say, the song that um, is now the title that Larry was speaking of, everyone loved. Everyone loved. And, and they, all they had were the, the lyrics and they loved it. So we're on target here, I think. Larry, speaking about Tiffany now, and speaking about our new show now, and speaking about your career in general, what would you like people to take away from this as a composer, and a lyricist, and a New England grad, and a guy of a certain age? Oh boy. <laughs> Just that um, I hope they can connect to what I'm trying to say in my music and lyrics. And if you don't, that's all right, too. But uh, I just hope you uh, can enjoy it and learn from it and just maybe keep track of other things that we'll be working on in the future. And I think the best that a show can do, anything, a movie, a television show, a Broadway musical, is that people come out having learned something. But entertainment is always the first thing. And this is an extremely entertaining, dramatic, funny, silly, all oh, kinds, yeah. everything's there. But it also, you're going to go leave and, uh, you know, when you, whether you go out for a cup of tea or, or a martini, you're going to go, hmm, and I think it will stick with you and make you just wonder. Yeah. 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 And that's the power of a, a really good show is that not only does it entertain, 
but it gives you pause to, th to think about it later on. It's not like a show that's a fluff that when it's done, you've already forgotten about it. What's the next one? This one hopefully can resonate with you and, you know, help. But also, it's not heavy in message. You really oh, will no. enjoy it. I mean, it. I love it. I love it. And the music is great, and the lyrics are great, the characters are great. But the book is great. Yeah, thank you. But when you, but it, even for me, as part of the creation of it, when I put down the writing for a day, or Larry's songs, and clear my head and go for a ride in the country, that's when it really, its its impact is its greatest on me. So I know it's one of those kinds of shows. After the show, you go, you get it. Two days, three days, a week, a month. You come back and see it again. All right, Larry. What about, do you want to put out a, uh, a website or maybe uh, an email if people want to communicate with us over the production email and, uh, you know? Well, let's see. We did come up with a couple of ideas of um, website or Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So let me... Well, I don't think we really locked in on anyone just yet. Oh, Maybe that's right. We haven't we haven't launched it yet. We've just been talking about it. Well, we will do well, that we do soon. Have, we do have a Gmail called the Life of Excellence at Gmail dot com. Excellent. The Life of okay. Excellence at Excellent. Gmail dot com, yep. which is not the title. <laughs> not, not this week, no. No, not this week. Okay, Larry. Thank you so much. I know we'll be talking and working and doing all the stuff that we want to do. And ladies and gentlemen, write us, tell us what you think, and we'll be uh, teasing you with some songs by Larry Dresner, songs and lyrics by Larry Dresner on YouTube very soon. Stay safe. Bye now. Bye, Larry. This is so much fun. I love working with the fabulous Marcello Rolando with me on the other side of the camera, or microphone in this case. For years, Marcello was a splendid addition to the cast of Another World on NBC. He was the owner, manager, man in charge of Tops, our swanky restaurant in Bay City. And as a producer and director on the show, I got to see him more often than most and was thrilled to have him on board. I depended on him to take charge, which he did with a plum. Our cast, including the lovely Linda Dano, Stephen Schnetzer, Charles Keating, all remarked how special he was to have there. He made everyone, regular cast members and guest actors alike, feel special and welcome. Marcello adds a touch of class to whatever he does, and we were thrilled to have him with us on our show for such a long time. He is so thoughtful now to reach out to his peers for a conversation about how we're all surviving this pandemic. It's a challenge, but with each other's help and support, we will survive with more stories to tell. Hello, I'm Marcello Rolando here with my pets and pet peeves, hoping you'll join me in a wake-up cup of coffee. Beating the memory lane crowd. Now that turkeys shop before Black Friday, it's not surprising that some media personality shows are rushing into 2013 year-end memories before it's even Christmas Eve. Most of us know memories recapture us and replay in the twinkling of an eye, an aromatic breeze, a squeeze of the shoulder, or in the moment of that burned taste after a fire. Faster than a mouse-clicked link, you're back to that owl in the woods. First kiss, wedding day, first shared Christmas tree, or moment of silence. Memories take us back to rain on a tin roof, our car driving us the long way home, an uncle's cackle, fireplace crackling, an aunt's snowing smile, grandma's special homemade icing, barking dogs, parents independently slipping a few twenties into your palm, and there you are, back at the beginning of the roller coaster ride, inhaling all of a teenager's unknowns, smelling the sweets before tasting the bitter, the sound of the wind and the chilly feel of snow in our face, blowing hair backwards and propelling dreams forward. Imagine Utah, Colorado, and Virginia easing toward cuddling up to justice and equality for all, despite some being drag-queened forward, kicking and screaming in their red boots. When friends share memories with me, I remember who, what, and why I celebrate in life. 
mostly its lifelong friends, Lance and Pamela, Mercedes McCambridge, or newcomers, Boomy, Bill, Daniel, and Michelle. Chance meetings on the streets of New York City, like hailing a cab for Carol Channing, a chatty stroll with Colin Dewhurst, James Whitmore, and Tommy Toon, a gracious nod from passing Glenn Close and Tony Randall, quite literally running into Nathan Lane and Jack Lemon. Jane Alexander's thank you, an answered note from Julie Harris, telephone chats with Celeste Holm, book signing with Pavarotti, supervising Juilliard students during an invited-only rehearsal of Placido Domingo's Met conducting debut, and a moment backstage at Ford's Theatre with Rosalind Russell. The point is not name-dropping, or tears during Oscar night memorials, or even how much I miss Peter O'Toole, who I never met, or Mom, who I'll never forget. The point is, every moment is a memory in the making, and every one a reason for celebration, and tis the season every day, in every way. Thank you for continuing to listen to, support, and share the Reasonable Voice Blog Talk Radio with family and friends, especially online. We enjoy hearing from you, and in response, yes, we are now accepting new company and business advertisers and welcoming organizations seeking to be one of our sponsors. So please do continue to email us at thereasonablevoice at gmail.com. However, if you prefer to simply make a donation, your donations are greatly appreciated and can be made through PayPal by clicking on the donate button found at the top of the homepage of the Reasonable Voice. Dot com website. Thank you for joining us today to make every day as reasonable as possible. We hope you will download and share our downloadable podcasts. I'm Marcello Rolando, the Reasonable Voice, hoping you will become one of the reasonable voices heard round the world.